just to say that Bright Blue is doing a year-long project looking to build a balanced uh, centre-right agenda on immigration. Uh, and that project has various different elements, uh, one of which is this commission. Uh, we've received evidence from a variety of organisations and experts, written evidence in August, uh, and this is the second part of the commission being an oral evidence session. It's being filmed. Um, it will be live on our website in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, and the transcripts plus the written evidence will be in a final re written report that we'll produce at the end of the year. And on top of that, we'll have some policy recommendations from Bright Blue. Um, the commissioners here are from a range of backgrounds uh, and, and won't agree necessarily with everything Bright Blue says at the end, uh, but we'll have some searching questions for you today. So how we'll play it is um, that I'll ask you to introduce yourself, perhaps you'll uh, give us some introductory remarks uh, on your view uh, of border control, visas and detention centres um, uh, and how current government policy is working and how it can be improved uh, and then we'll open it up to questions from the commissioners. So um, perhaps I could start with James. Uh, yeah, sure. So. Uh, James Slack, I'm the Home Affairs Editor at the Daily Mail. Um, I'm required to say Twitter style, all views are my own rather than that of my employer. Um, but I'll do my best to, uh, to answer your questions. Um, I, I said um, when I replied to the invite, detention is not my area of expertise, so I will pass when it comes to questions on detention. But in terms of immigration policy and where it may or may not be going wrong and how it should be changed, then I'm very happy to um, take more questions. Great, okay, thank you, James. Uh, okay, so if we can now uh, move over to uh, Jerry. Good afternoon. I should also say views are my own rather than the company's, but um, by way of background, I've got something like 33 years custodial management experience, starting in the prison service as an assistant governor, governor, area manager, joining the private sector some nine years ago. Current role is as Managing Director of GFRS Custodial and Detention Services and I'm responsible for the operation in full of five prisons and three immigration centres, Brook House and Tinsley House on uh, the perimeters of Gatwick and Cedars pre-departure accommodation some six miles away. So my experience is very much in that area. Okay. Um, so. I think the first question I'll ask is to James. I mean, a lot of organisations, for example, the China, the British Chinese uh, Visa Alliance organisation, will say the visa system is just not quick enough, and that's really disadvantageous um, for British business, for Chinese uh, investors, for Chinese tourists. I mean, what's your sort of view on um, the efficiency of our visa system, and could it be improved, or is the government getting it right? Um, I think particularly in relation to China, uh, they have recognised that um, given the huge economic potential of better relations with China that they need to perhaps go further. I think George Osborne in particular has recognised that fact. And the Home Office have been taking steps to um, introduce a faster visa regime. Um, I dare say that there's more to do with the visa system uh, in general is bureaucratic and it has been beset by many sort of well-documented problems but I do get the sense that it is improving somewhat. Can I ask us a broad politics of policy question about you know, the, the immigration policy? Um, I mean, it's quite interesting that there's a broad consensus. I mean, actually, Migration Watch, IPPR, you know, the academics who looked at, have quite a clear view about what we're expecting current flows to be like. Yes. So Migration Watch say in the next parliament, you know, maybe 120,000 net a year from inside the EU maybe about the same from outside given the policies that we've got. What what do you think the government can do about having got a target that's half the number in terms of the gap between, you know, getting the numbers towards the target they've got but also maybe getting the chance to reset the target after the election? Yeah. Is is there a target that people believe that you could that you could promise and keep? Um right, l lots of different bits there. Um I think what the past four or five years have shown is that the target the Prime Minister picked was the wrong target in the sense that you have something, you, you can't really fix a target over which you don't have control of large elements of it. Now, he had a promise to bring down net migration. He has no control, obviously, over emigration of both British nationals and to an extent 
foreign citizens and he also obviously has no control over the number of EU citizens who are coming in. So to set a target over which you uh, cannot achieve it through, uh, through policy means seems, seems a little foolish um, and it's proved to be the case. However, the idea of a target is the right one. Um, the public, uh, every opinion poll will tell you that the public are concerned about immigration and they're concerned about the way immigration has been managed and a target is a helpful way um, of uh, the public being able to hold the government to account every three months or every year when those um, migration statistics are published. So I think the challenge for them now is to find a new target uh, but one over which they do have control. Now that for starters I suspect means removing emigration from it and then secondly um, you're on to the issue of what you what do you do about the EU. Now they can fix a target which says we will just less in X number of non-EU citizens, um, including students. And I do think it's important that they include students. There's obviously a pressure to remove them from the system, but um, the fact is students are more often than not here for more than a year. They do use services, um, they do contribute to the economy, and it's also a fact that they don't all go home. I think, you know, there's home office studies will tell you that perhaps one in ten do not go home when their course is finished. Uh, uh, and they stay illegally and then obviously others will then stay on for um, for legal reasons. So I think it would be dishonest to remove students from the system because you're not measuring immigration, you're just measuring an element of immigration. So that would be the first point. My second sort of point would be actually how honest is the target on immigration full stop when it's not dealing with EU migration which is at the moment at least half and possibly more um, of the inflow. Now linked to that is, is obviously the big question of how does, the, how does the Prime Minister seek to control EU migration and what can he do about the Free Movement Directive. I don't have the answer to that question but I think that is the big question for the next eight months um, for the Conservative Party and it's the manifesto uh, I think if it wants to stand up scrutiny and do what the public would hope it will do he's going to have to find a solution to limiting uh, workers from within the EU and not simply focusing on benefits. I mean benefits in a sense is a red herring. The, the number of people who come here from within the EU to claim benefits is, as every study I think has showed you, minimal. It's more about an issue of people coming here to work and the reasons they're attracted to come here, um, uh, one of which is, is um, a very generous in-work tax credit system. Now, whether or not the Prime Minister looks at those in-work tax credits and decides to do something with those, that's one possibility. But um, certainly um, uh, he has to find a means of addressing EU migration. I mean, just to say, actually, you're right, uh, most immigrants don't come uh, seeking benefits, but the UK public attitude seems to suggest a lot, a lot of the UK do think they're coming for seeking benefits. There's mm. transatlantic trends just come out. Interesting report, which which shows that UK is quite high on the number of people in the public who think that. David, you had a question. Um, yeah, I mean, sort of coming down from the high politics to um, visas and the borders agency and so on. About perhaps more on Jerry than um, than um, James, but, but both of you. I mean, the, we spend. Um, it's in the low hundreds of millions, I think, uh, on the borders aspect of the Home Office. Um, I can't remember, it's sort of six or seven hundred million, that may be net of some of the um, money that flows in. It's an absolutely trivial sum of money, considering how important this issue is, you know, how getting the balance between being open enough for the economic benefits of moderate levels of immigration. Um, while at the same time responding to the clear democratic view that, um, that immigration has been too high in recent years. Um, getting that balance right, a lot of getting that balance right is about quite technical things about how quickly you process visas, whether you, where you know people are and so on. Why on earth do we spend, I think it's 0.3% of all public spending, um, and why, you know, why don't political parties, why, why doesn't the Labour Party perhaps trying to trying to um, uh, deal with some of the damage that we suffered over this issue, it proposed trebling the amount of money. And if it did, 
could we actually spend the money wisely? Um, I mean, would it, would it be foolish, actually, to spend um, £2 billion on border controls rather than £700 million? Um, um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. I, I, I've got a follow-up point, I'll make that later. I think as it was directed initially at me, um, I think my difficulty is that I see it at the other end of that process in terms of detainees coming into my care and very often without any documentation and that's one of the issues that we have to struggle with and deal with. Would it help? My personal feeling is yes it would help to have greater control uh, and knowledge at the front end of the process um, because that would enable us to deal much more effectively and indeed rapidly with the um, detention of the either admittance into the country on a temporary or permanent basis or of the removal of the detainees. And for me it seems that that's an essential part of the process and it's important that it operates smoothly to give public confidence. Yeah. And we don't actually, we hardly remove anyone, do we? I mean, it, because, partly because it's incredibly expensive. It's um, very difficult in terms of legal processes, yeah. um, let alone the fact that in this geopolitical world we're actually um, facing problems of some countries being acceptable to remove detainees. What is the actual figure? Do you know how many I don't know? off the top of my head, I'm afraid, because I would know one part of it, but not the entire picture. Um, do you know, Jane, do you know how many? I don't know. How many, do, how many do, do, does your company uh, you know, across a year involved in? Well, our capacity um, would be in the order of 650 detainees at any one time maximum, and then up to 40 in the pre-departure accommodation at Cedars. So it's a relatively small number. Um, we operate generally to the capacity of the detain detention centres. Um, I would have to write separately on that because I don't have that figure on top of my I head. I think I'll the problem is that the Home Office make it incredibly difficult actually for you to know because yeah. a removal uh, in Home Office terms c it could constitute somebody who's been you know, literally fighting their way through the system for five years, incredibly difficult case, or it could involve somebody who's literally been turned around. Um, at Gatwick and they ca characterise more of the same now. I don't think the public would understand a man <laughs> just turned on at Gatwick as a removal, yeah. but they're included in the numbers all the same, yeah. so it's, it's difficult to tell. I mean, but, but, but can, can, can I, I don't give a quite good an answer to my question. I mean, you know, if, if we could wave a magic wand and double yeah. the amount of money, um, I mean, I, I appreciate you only see one corner, but you, you, you've worked in the system for a while, you, want, you know roughly how the whole system works. I mean, would it be a sensible use of public funds? To actually double the amount of money we spend on this, and 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 if so, where would we put the money? I mean, what 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 functions need enhancing if we could double the amount of money? Involved? My personal view is that um, the money would be better spent at the front end. Um, what do you mean by that? By quite. knowing the numbers coming into the country, where they're going, and how they're being cared for, and inevitably, I will always come at the back end of the process, by definition really, and I actually think the um, control... Are about, sorry, are we talking about all immigrants here, or refugees, or asylum seekers, or...? The entire range, um, and that does cover an entire range, but I actually think I and the public would expect the borders to know the numbers coming in, and the purposes why they're right, coming in, right. and actually I think that would be the most effective expenditure of money. Mm. I think, and uh, counting them out too. I, I think, think yeah, yeah, em yeah, enforcement's the issue, and that works. Uh, that works alongside e-borders or whatever it's been renamed at the moment. I mean, a functioning immigration system ought to count everybody That's into. Still not, yeah, I mean, the sort of digital borders or whatever. So e-borders yeah. is still no, not it's happening. It's always no, it's like it's nuclear uh, fission or whatever it is. Yeah. It's always sort of ten years off. Mid next year, I think, yeah. is the latest offering. But, I mean. It, uh, if the system were to function properly, everyone who came into the country would be logged by e-borders. They would come in, whether it be a visitor visa for X months or a student visa for X months, and at that at the point where their visa, uh, you know, got to its limits, 
um, the computer system would flag up the fact that this person has gone home, so they should or they're not here. If they, had, if, if they hadn't gone home, then you would have sufficient enforcement resources to go and find that person yeah. and um, make them leave the country. Otherwise, what's the point, essentially, in having a visa system if it's not enforced? Um, yeah. When the people are here now, I have sympathy for Theresa May. I mean, she didn't ask, you know, the finances are as she found them. Uh, she had no option, really, but to um, take the cuts of sort of 20%. Um, but if you give more enforcement staff, then obviously more people will, will leave the country. And, and more importantly, it sends out that message actually that mm. there's no point coming to Britain and trying to sort of chance your luck by staying on after your visa. Um, mm. You'll have to leave because if not, someone I will come in. Somebody at the Home Office told me what they, their internal estimate is that about 20% of all people who come here on the whole range of visas every year overstay, not necessarily very long, but given there are 2 million people. Is 400,000 yeah. people. I mean, that is a lot of people. Possibly some of them only overstaying for a few weeks. But I mean, a lot does that does that figure sort of chime with what you've heard? I think that's something you'd have to get your figure from the Home Office. So. What I did. Yeah. I mean, well, in that case, I wouldn't want to <laughs> double guess that. Okay, let's let's ask you a question that's more in your specific remit then. Um, enforcement is part of having an immigration system. The public clearly want firm controls. They also want a fair system, I think that's clear, you're at the very tough end having to do deportations and removals. In terms of the, uh, the case where you know, three of your staff, I think, were, were charged with manslaughter over unlawful killing of uh, Jimmy Benga, I mean, how, how, how strong an assurance could you give us that that could not now happen again in the future, and what, what, what are the reasons that you'd, that you'd, that you'd be confident that that, that, that is now uh, something that couldn't be repeated? Right, the first issue I've obviously got to be aware of is that it's up to you to say at the moment because the criminal case is yet to um, come to court. In terms of um, prevention, and that's obviously a, a vital element, I'm very aware that uh, um, the Home Office have looked at different forms of restraint because it's well known that um, if you are having to restrain an individual, you have to be very careful about what's known as positional asphyxia and the signs of positional asphyxia and so forth. Um, as I understand it in the case in point, the Jimmy Mavenga case, um, it was a restraint in very restricted conditions and I know that's even more difficult and there needs to be a very clearly defined um, process by which individuals can be restrained and by the methods they can be restrained in those conditions. My understanding is now that people are being trained appropriately for uh, restraining people in such situations. Sadly, um, there have been cases of people dying under restraint through positional asphyxia in a number of locations through history. And um, it's one of those things that people are now very well trained for in general, and there's been some specific if training. Fix the training. Um, would you have any objection to independent observers of every you know, deportation removal? I, absolutely not. I would prefer that. And actually, we've introduced a system whereby um, staff in our establishments wear body-worn videos so that in any uh, planned interventions for a long time have been videoed. We as a company, through uh, recent contracts, have introduced body-worn videos by a large number of staff on um, a 24-hour basis that where an incident is happening, they switch on the video, make it known, and it records both vision and sound. So that's a protection both for the um, individual being restrained and for the staff. I, I'm a huge advocate of that and a huge believer in it because actually the very presence de-escalates incidents very swiftly and I'd much rather have an incident de-escalate than actually happen. So I would welcome any observation by any independent um, body of such occurrences. Jerry, can I, can I ask just how many detention centres do you run and who else is in the market? So Circo is, uh, is another, uh, who else is there? there um, Circo have one centre at the moment, Yarrowswood in Bedfordshire. Um, we operate the three. Mighty are the other uh, major um, company in the marketplace and they run uh, 
uh, for detention centres. And obviously, um, prison service also run a number, as I recall, four at this moment in time. And what's the commissioning process like from to run those centres? What's the kind of uh, I mean, how long is the kind of application process, as it were, and, and how when when does it come up for a new renewal? Well, um, generally, the contracts now are for five years with possible extensions of three times one year. Um, the two immigration removal centres at Heathrow have just been awarded and just been mobilised by Mighty, and there's an ongoing competition uh, for Yarrowswood in Bedfordshire. The process can take anything up to nine months. There's obviously the invitation to tender. Um, companies go through a process to get through the first stage and then we enter the full bidding process. And as with any other commercial competition, um, we've got a specification which we work to and uh, which is costed appropriately. And I presume most companies in the market are bidding each time to run? Generally, yes. You may find, because of the number of bids going on at any one time, that a company will decide not to bid for a particular centre, but generally um, most companies will bid for most of the contracts. And certainly for Yarrowswood, my understanding is that all of the companies have entered bids for Yarrowswood. And just tell me about the different uh, layers of inspection that you face um, as a detention centre force? Um, it's very intensive and rightly so in my view. There's an on-site um, contract monitor who's a member of the Home Office and they are responsible for monitoring it. Um, within the company I am responsible for auditing the delivery and making sure of the delivery and it's compliant and so forth outside the company and the independence comes from Every immigration removal centre has an independent monitoring board, which is a group of lay um, people who have completely free access at any time to the establishment, can go anywhere within the establishment, look at any other documents other than the um, commercial documents for obvious reasons, but um, they would be present and we would encourage their presence at any time of an instant. Um, be it a planned incident, i.e. we have to, we know we're going to encounter some difficulties or in a long running incident we would ask them to come in to actually provide that safeguard. The Chief Inspector of Prisons uh, regularly inspects um, the establishment and uh, that's on the normal cycle, albeit um, they are increasing... Well. I would say it would be unusual for an IRC not to be inspected every two years. But obviously that's for the Chief Inspector to determine. Um, and the Home Office also have a series of audit visits and so forth. So I'm, I'm really genuinely pleased by the range of examinations that we um, undergo because that gives confidence not only to the public and to the authority, but also gives me confidence. Alongside that, you'll have um, specialist auditors such as NHS England for healthcare, because all of the IRCs have now moved their healthcare arrangements to um, be commissioned by NHS England, and that's a very recent change and a very positive change. And um, other care quality commission would come under those auspices also so it's a very wide-ranging area where children are involved there are local safeguarding arrangements um, and it's a very open environment strange though that may seem is there anything else do you think which could be introduced to improve public confidence in the system my personal feeling is that I would like to see um, more um, opportunity for media to come and have a look at what we do and how we do it um, because again I believe that is the correct way. Um, we do have media visits that's outside of my control I may recommend it but ultimately it's for the authority to decide whether or not access should be given.
and that's within the terms of the contract. I actually believe in transparency in these contracts I, because we've got nothing to hide and indeed the more we can inform and have the debate the better it will be and um, it saddens me when I see inspectorate reports for example which may be very critical um, and companies or agencies don't put up someone to actually explain because I actually believe I've got a responsibility to explain what we do, some of the difficulties of what we do, and the work the staff do in sometimes incredibly difficult and very occasionally dangerous circumstances. What would, what would you describe? I know you've got the inspectorate reports and, and so on. What, what, how would you characterise the level of parliamentary engagement with that? I mean, is, is, that, is that a route where you could see more transparency or light being shed on it in a useful way? Or does that yes. Um, again, I would welcome an informed debate because we only get informed debate, in my view, if we have people coming and visit us and actually challenging us about what are you doing, why are you doing it, and how you're doing it. And so we don't see many members of parliament. We, we inevitably um, get questions, not as many as I would expect. Um, and it's one of those things that actually to have an informed debate it's my duty to inform people. Okay, thank you very much. Um, James, um, you know sometimes the Daily Mail will come under criticism um, uh, for kind of stoking up the debate on immigration. Do you think the government has taken the right steps in improving public confidence in the system? Has it improved in the last three or four years? Would, would your paper say, actually, the government is getting it right, the system is more under control, numbers have come down, there's less fraud? Uh, I mean, what's, what's the sort of general view on that? Well, obviously, disagree with the, the idea that the, the, the use of the word stoking up, but I mean, we, we simply report what's happening in the system. Um, the figures from the polling would not suggest that public confidence in the system is improving. Um, it, it norm the figure has been about 80% of people think there is too much immigration and don't really trust the system for as long as I can remember. That figure seems, seems pretty fixed. Um, have the government been making efforts, or have the Home Office in particular been making efforts? Um, absolutely, yes, um, but they inherited an incredibly dysfunctional system. Um, a system which had been tinkered with constantly over a period of five years where staff morale was at absolute rock bottom and which had backlogs in every conceivable area of business from you know, visa to asylum and working through those processes has been incredibly difficult. There have been inevitable sort of scandals along the way over the last four or five years and the public, you know, we, we report these things, the public see them, and um, I think, uh, you know, there remains a lot for the government to do to persuade the public that we have a, a system which is managed and which is fair um, both to migrants themselves and to, you know, people who are already living here. On, 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 that, on that front, I mean, our, our research into attitudes shows obviously there is very low public trust, widespread scepticism about the handling of immigration. It's quite it's something people don't often realise is that public attitudes, in terms of most people, is a very hostile sort of minority group. Most people are actually quite pro-migrant at the same time as being very sceptical of the handling of immigration and that's I think that's why the debate actually you know does sometimes retain some balance. James I wonder do you have any advice to um, migrants themselves who are probably you know often you know not massive fans of the Daily Mail sometimes about how they could get their voices heard more in the mail or other media in terms of the lived experience of coming to Britain? I think oh, I, my first point would be I mean I think it's difficult to sort of produce you know to, to just to build migrants all in this one sort of group I think that's um, I'm not sure how, how that would work um, I mean in terms of groups uh, I mean for instance the um, Polish embassy um, uh, made contact when there were lots of stories over um, in relation to large numbers arriving from Poland and I think have been you know whenever they've had 
um, uh, things which they wanted to say than they've been reflected in, in the media. Um, I think. Uh, I mean, it's not. I suppose what I'm trying to say is, it's not as if there are lots of groups representing migrants who are banging down the media's door and saying we would like you to represent this, and, and we're saying no, we won't. It's it's more. About so you you don't think? I mean, as a distance, say you don't you don't really hear from those groups perhaps because they think that they, you wouldn't be receptive. But you're saying you sort of you'd reflect that within the balance of what was going on generally. I I I can't. You, you know, I, we are. We would treat every approach, you know, the same. And if 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 it were something which were um, uh, interesting as a story, then we'd look at it and you know would report it, or we wouldn't. Which which applies, you know, across the board to everything we do. But I can't think of a, an instance of a group who's been sort of banging down the the media's door, whichever from whichever perspective, and the media have said no, we're not listening. I think it's more the fact that those approaches don't really take place. Any other questions from the commissioners? Great. I don't know if there's any other questions you have for us at this stage or any other points that you want to make. No, I mean, what, what, uh, I suppose I would ask what your time frame is and what your ultimate goal is in terms of who are you trying to influence? Yeah, um, so we're trying to influence uh, particularly conservative policy um, and uh, to get a kind of more ba we, we we feel the debate is, is very negative on immigration in terms of its consequences and its causes so we want to bring a bit of balance to that um, but obviously what we're not trying to do is open all the borders and you know let everybody in it's a kind of much more middle ground approach that we're looking for um, in terms of our sort of media strategy perhaps we can do that offline uh, and talk about uh, some of the polling that we've done uh, and this final report uh, and, and feed that into you um, and hopefully something we can generate something from that.